So first of all, I am going to focus on what's coming in the next five to ten years. And uh, you will all appreciate to know where we're going. We need to know where we're coming from. So Juan showed this slide. I think it's a very important slide in his talk. And I'm just going to put it up again because I think it's important to uh, emphasize some of the changes recently uh, outlined in the easel guidelines. These are primarily related to the change in nomenclature. And why do I think these are important? I think they're important in 2017 when we think about personalized medicine that we should not be excluding essentially batches of patients that we label as immune tolerant versus immune active, etc. And the new easel guidelines, the change in nomenclature there certainly allow us to focus more on individual patients and the individual patient requirements. However, there's always a however, I think there are some limitations and I think you could argue that the easel guidelines are in some way a little bit conservative because in there there are a couple of issues that I would certainly challenge. One of them is this age of 30 years as a threshold for those who are at higher risk or lower risk. And one of the things we were listening to just now was the debate about sur surface antigen, surface antigenemia and HCC risk and this is really at the centre of this debate. Another issue is about the low replicative state. Where are we with the low replicative state? Are these patients safe? Is this a, 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 a disease profile that we may want to achieve in terms of treatment? And if we get there, is that good enough? And then finally, in the last of the, of the three points I put here, is this threshold of 2,000 international units. And just above this threshold of 2,000 international units, should we be treating these patients more aggressively? Should we be bringing treatment in earlier? Are we happy to sit and wait and watch these patients? So these are questions which I don't have the answer to today, and I don't know if we're going to have the answer in the next five to 10 years, but are very important nonetheless. One of the things that I would point out is the difficulty with this arbitrary uh, age threshold, because here is a patient from my clinic, age 23. The clinical profile here is typical for what would be described as tolerant, but when you biopsy these patients, those of you who are keen uh, uh, histopathologists will see the spurs emerging from the portal tracts, indicating an Ishak fibrosis stage 3. And really, suffice to say at this point, I really want to emphasize the importance of looking at each individual uh, uh, individually. On top of that, you know, going back to the debate about the role of biopsy in hepatitis B patients, is certainly at the outset at the time of diagnosis and planning of management, whereby I think further down the line in terms of monitoring, I think that fiber scan is certainly an adequate strategy. These are data that we published last year in gastroenterology, and these really emphasize this point. What I'm showing you here is the Ishak fibrosis stage across these more historical disease phases of tolerance, immune active, and E-antigen negative immune active. Essentially, when we look at Ishak fibrosis stage in these patients at a young age, these are age-matched patients, we don't see differences in the degree of fibrosis. When we look at this in more detail with uh, tools like collagen proportionate area, so showing up here is cirrus red. Again, we see no real difference in, differences in these patients. Again, showing you the limitations of just looking at markers of fibrosis when you're trying to profile disease. What is important, however, is when you look at these biopsies and we look at them in more detail, when we look at the immunohistochemical analysis, here is staining for core antigen and surface antigen. And one of the markers that we're beginning to see you know, what underlines the kind of heterogeneity of hepatitis B is that we are seeing patterns of more focused nuclear core staining in these patients with high viremia and low transaminases, suggesting that there may be a subset of patients there who are genuinely in a more tolerant phase of the disease. But based on the serum ALT and DNA, I would say at this point, we can't really draw any firm conclusions. The same publication, we were able to show that in these patients who may be more tolerant, that there's certainly higher nuclear core, as I show you here on the left, but as you migrate across the disease phases, we see more of this red blotching, the classical ground glass appearance of surface engine staining, and as you go further into the disease profiles, that surface engine staining is increasing while the nuclear core is beginning to decrease. And similarly, some people have seen these data before, but we're able to show when we look in these clinic and when we look at these patients that there's evidence of clonal hepatocyte expansion, 
evidence of HPVD integration in these patients labeled tolerant as young as 15. So these are patients in our clinic, our transition clinics, with significant disease and what I would say events taking part or driving the hepatic carcinogenesis. So these are important points to make, that these patients at a very young age may already be in a pattern or in a stage of development of disease further down the line. So this brings the discussion right back to the, to the issues around monitoring of these patients for the development of HCC and screening patients, et cetera. But within the natural history, I think what's important to underline probably is the limitations of the parameters that we're using at present. If you take the new ESL guidelines, the division of these disease phases into E engine positive chronic infection versus E engine positive chronic hepatitis, denoted by more biochemical activity, of course. And then you look at the E antigen negative, low replicative stage, what we historically call the inactive carriage or asymptomatic carrier phase, and then E antigen negative chronic hepatitis. How good are these phases at identifying the patients, at indicating the, where the patients will go in terms of the disease, and essentially in terms of offering a stratification? Well, I would argue that ALT and DLA, DNA alone are probably inadequate, and we should certainly be considering much more the use of quantitative surface antigen, which as an adjunct will probably help us to better define these patients. Remember, we discuss quite often about surface antigen having an immunosuppressive effect, and in the early phases of disease, that immunosuppressive effect of surface antigen and E antigen may be important, but as you proceed through over the course of the disease, the surface antigen declines, and at that stage, we want to know how are we better able to identify patients who will remain in a stable state versus those who will progress to E antigen negative chronic hepatitis and will need treatment. I know Jeff is going to talk about in this in more detail, so I'm not going to spend any more time on this at the moment. So what about treatment and management strategies going forward? Well, essentially, in order to look at this, again, what are we using in the clinics at the moment? We're using tenofovir and tecovir. We're all very familiar with these drugs and their ability to reverse fibrosis. But as Jeff was just saying, while we're able to prevent uh, the development or while we're able to reverse fibrosis, we're able to reduce progression to HCC, we know that we're not able to prevent it, so we need strategies as we go forward to do this. Current therapies, essentially pegylator interferon, which offers, of course, sustained immune control, but it only offers it in a minority of patients. Patients don't want to take pegylator interferon, and certainly in the era of the DEAs and HCV, people think it is a backward step to be still talking about pegylator interferon in treatment of hepatitis B. E antigen positive, E antigen negative patients treated with nukes, we see limited decline in surface antigen, and I would go as far to say that in the antigen negative patients treated with nukes, the level of surface antigen loss is probably equal to that of natural surface antigen loss. So we see no real benefit with nukes in the antigen negative patients who are on nukes over the longer term. And of course, long term viral suppression is achieved, but sustained immune control following treatment cessation is limited and sometimes coded at about 10%, again, highlighting the inadequacies of current therapy. We also know that we can start these patients on drugs at a very early stage, maintain them at a very long time, because we know there are the risk of the systemic effects now well documented uh, with tenofovir in hepatitis B. So the future prospects for HPV cure, so where are we moving? We're talking about now five and 10 years. We'll probably go back to the HPV life cycle, and I'm just gonna highlight some of the areas here, looking at some of the targets of the life cycle, starting on the top left, with entry inhibitors moving across to SIRNAs, capsid inhibitors, and nukes, and then down to the inhibitors of surface engine release, immune modulation, and of course, targets of CCCCDNA, which of course will be the goal of all therapies to eradicate hepatitis B over the longer term. We know, of course, that the CCCDNA serves as a reservoir of transcriptional virus, so as long as it exists within the hepatocyte nucleus, there's risk of reactivation, and the patient will remain in that state where there's always the possibility of disease progression. So first of all, starting with nukes. So we know the recent data from the TAF studies, the study 110 looking at the antigen positive patient and study 108 looking at the antigen negative patients. The primary endpoint here being HPV DNA suppression less than 29 international units and secondary safety endpoints looking at both bone and renal parameters to ensure reduced uh, systemic effects. 
Suffice to say, with uh, week 96 data and data now emerging beyond this, we can see that viral suppression with TNAF, with TAF versus tenofovir is non-inferior, and we see for both uh, for ALT normalization, bone and renal safety, that we see that TAF performs significantly better than tenofovir. And of course, in Gilead's uh, uh, perspective, TAF will form the backbone of treatment as we move forward and it will be used probably in combination with some of the new therapies that I'm going to show you. So what about immune modulation? This is probably one of the areas that we're most interested at present. And I'm just going to start by showing you the TLR7, GX9620. This is at phase two at the moment. But unfortunately, this has been, I would say, less than, um, hasn't quite met the level of expectation that we thought it would offer. We know that it has the ability to modulate the innate immune response, specifically around the CD56 NK bride cells and mate population. But unfortunately, what we saw in this context was while we see very specific dose-dependent reproducible ISG15 induction, uh, what we are seeing on the right of this graphic as you look, very little change in baseline surface antigen. So where we thought TLR7 was offered significant reduction, we are not seeing the level of reduction that we thought we would initially. Well, don't worry, because there's always another TLR, and here's TLR8, and Gilead now are focusing on this, which is uh, in phase one, moving to phase 1B studies. And within TLR8, what we see is a much more global restoration of, of, of the immune response. So here we see targeting of the myeloid dendritic cells, monocytes, macrophages, neutrophils, and T regulatory cells, and all of these having different effects across the immune system with you know, effects improving antiviral cytokines, boosting the innate and adaptive arms of the immune response. And what we see with uh, the TLR8 or G S9668 is we see that you know we're not seeing or we don't envisage we'll have this systemic cytokine surge that the focus is very much on an intrahepatic uh, delivered increase in immune modulators and here you will see the effects happening within uh, four to six hours of delivery of the drug. So while TLR7 seems to have been fallen to a degree, although it remains in phase two studies, TLR8 certainly looks like something which offers much more promise as we go forward. What about anti-PD-1? Well, we've talked about anti-PD-1 for a long time. These are some data from, uh, from the anti-PD-1 inhibitor nivolumab, and this is really looking at 22 patients. And what's interesting here really is the use of the anti-PD-1 uh, in these patients and then follow up with a primary endpoint to 12 weeks post-administration of the drug. So essentially, these patients are virally suppressed on tenofovir. They're e antigen negative patients treated with the anti-PD-1. And the primary efficacy endpoint here is change in surface antigen, or again, focusing or trying to achieve functional cure 12 weeks following uh, dose delivery. What we've seen is in two out of 22 patients, there is a significant greater than 0.5 log reduction in surface antigen, and one patient with a greater one log reduction in surface antigen at either time point going from 12 to 24 weeks. What is important to stress here is I would say that if you look at the data from, from this study, you will see that the one patient who did achieve surface antigen had a significant biochemical flare up to about 300, while all, all the other patients had flares up to the order of about 60 to 80. So again, is this emphasizing that the anti-PD-1 in this case, restoring functional immune response, but causing hepatocyte death and wiping out the CCCDNA reservoir? That again is a subject of debate and something that we will discuss no doubt further. So what about capsid inhibitors? Well, certainly, as in uh, more recently, the focus has been on capsid inhibitors, and we've got phase 1b studies, which are now emerging, moving into phase 2a. And the capsid inhibitor, or this is uh, assembly bias, caps, cap, core protein allosteric modulator, this targets core protein, its functions, and related CCCDNA generation. So again, if you look at the life cycle, it will target maintenance of CCCDNA, it'll target encapsidation of pregenomic RNA, and it will also target CCCDNA formation itself. 
What do we see when we see it compared to entecavir alone? Well, you see that the capsid inhibitor on the top here, HPV DNA levels, entecavir is very successful at being able to, to uh, inhibit replication, but of course there's no function on the left of this slide in terms of pregenic pregenomic RNA encapsidation, and the cap, whereas the capsid inhibitor does, and the capsid inhibitor is also able to tackle uh, this uh, H pregenomic RNA levels uh, showed here in the bottom corner of this slide. So clearly the uh, capsid inhibitor is outgunning in Tecovir in this case in terms of its more global response. And here you will see again the entecavir showing you the reduction in, in HPV DNA, but little effects on CCC DNA as measured by E antigen, surface antigen, and pregenomic RNA, whereas you look at the capsid inhibitor with significant impact here on HPV DNA, E antigen, surface antigen, and pregenomic RNA. So if we move on to siRNA and capsid inhibitors, so more recently there's been some work looking at these delivered in combination, and this combination of these drugs has the ability to offer you two different mode of actions. Of course, the siRNA we know is very successful at reducing levels of surface antigen with pangenotypic activity, and it combined with a capsid inhibitor here, given with standard of care in Tecovir, uh, and pegylid interferon is able to show significant reductions in serum HPV DNA in a very short period of time. So again, emphasizing the robustness and the efficacy of these drugs used in combination with standard of care. So what do we think we're getting from these combinations, or what do we think RNAIs or core protein inhibitors are offering us? Well, in this combination, we go back to this issue about surface antigen being immunosuppressive. We think that the combination of these drugs can reduce the viral antigen burden, reduce DNA, and by doing so, allow immune restoration and immune recognition, and by doing so, offer you the ability to achieve functional cure, as we see in healthy adults who are exposed to hepatitis B, have acute hepatitis B, and go on to lose surface antigen. Finally, I'm going to just refer briefly to therapeutic vaccination because we still have quite a few phase one studies and new phase one studies coming, although this is GS4774, which uh, its development was discontinued in 2016, but there's still probably a role for therapeutic vaccination, and this really we think is about restoration or just carrying the virus-specific response over the line in these patients who are E-antigen negative who are virally suppressed for a long period of time, and we want to be able to just see if we can boost their ability to get more global immune control of the virus. And then finally, this really is a slide which probably underlines the complexities of what we'll be looking at in the next five to 10 years as we move from where we are at the moment with, with viral suppressive agents to achieving functional cure. And on the right of this slide, as you look at it, this is really going to be about, we think, immune restoration, in combination with targeting of CCCDNA or the reservoir of virus, which as long as it's there, we see the ability for reactivation and the ability for pro progression of disease. So I will summarize with these closing remarks, just highlighting what I said at the outset, that the better understanding of HPV pathogenesis will be central to better treatment outcomes. And the reason I say this is there's a very good chance that we will offer different treatment strategies to patients in different phases of the disease based on what, they all, what we can see in terms of immunological readouts, et cetera. We all know that viral suppression is the standard of care in the clinic, but all my patients that I discuss treatment with them in the clinic at the moment, I say that this is the starting point of their treatment, and I genuinely see this as basically viral suppression to begin with, with newer agents being added on as we go forward into clinical trials. Clearly, there's a new era of HPV management which is emerging, and this will emerge to achieve functional cure defined by surface antigen loss, but of course the target will be the depletion or degradation of CCC DNA. That will have to be the goal if we're really talking about moving to complete eradication of hepatitis B, which I'm not sure we'll be able to see in 10 years, but that's again a subject for debate. And I would say that successful regimens going forward will combine uh, viral suppression with immune modulation and targeting of CCC DNA. So that leaves me probably with the most important slide, just to acknowledge all the people and our collaborators over the years working with us um, uh, on the various kind of aspects of our work at the Blizzard Institute in London. Thank you very much.